Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another Magic Arena upgrade guide video. Today we're taking a look at the Out for Blood starter deck, which is a mono black life gain slash vampire tribal deck. So let's dive right into it here. One of the major payoff cards in the deck is the Bloodthirsty Aerialist as a 3 mana 2 3 vampire rogue with flying that whenever we gain life gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter placed on it. So a very powerful card that will grow over time. Then looking at our entire list here, starting with the one drops, we have Knight of the Abbon Legion, which is a very powerful rare, seeing a ton of play in other decks in standard as well. Then we've got the full playset of Vampire of the Dire Moon as a 1-1 Death Toucher with Lifelink. That's also a Vampire. We've got two Bone Splinters as removal, requiring us to sacrifice a creature to destroy target creature. We've got two Disfigures as cheap removal, giving target creature minus two, minus two until end of turn. Then at two mana, we've got some more Vampires. Child of Night as a 2-1 Lifelinker that can help us trigger the Aerialist. We've got the Vampire Opportunist, which is also a 2 mana 2-1 two that can eventually start draining the opponent if we spend 7 mana in the late game to make the opponent lose 2 life and we gain 2 life. We've got Dark Remedy as a combo trick at instant speed, giving target creature plus 1 plus 3 until end of turn. We've got Soren's Thirst times 4 dealing 2 damage to target creature and gaining 2 life. Next up we've got the Centipede at 3 mana as a 3-2 insect that when it dies we get to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature we control. Of course the 2 copies of Aerialist. Then we've got 3 copies of Murder to destroy target creature at instant speed, no questions asked. And then at 4 mana we've got some more Vampires in Vindictive Vampire that whenever another creature we control dies the Vampire will deal 1 damage to each opponent and we gain 1 life. And finally we've got a Grave Waker as one of our curve toppers that for 7 mana can return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped and is also a 5-5 flyer. And then Meteor Golem as in all the monocolored starter decks to destroy target a non-land permanent an opponent controls when it enters the battlefield. And then 25 basic swamps. So that's our deck, now let's jump into a game and see how our deck does. Alright, we're on the draw. Our hand's not amazing since we only have the two lands, but uh, can still keep. We've got some uh, cheap interaction to stay afloat and then hopefully we'll pick up some lands to play the centipede. Up against Tranquil Cove, might be some sort of uh, ramp deck featuring Field of the Dead. Although maybe not, maybe it's just blue-white flyers. As we see a turn to Healer's Hawk, which I think I'm okay disfiguring here. Still have the thirst to kill something else. And we did pick up some lands. So we're looking at a turn 3 centipede perhaps. Empyrean Eagle, of course a nice payoff for the blue-white flyer deck. Can't kill it with the thirst, so we'll just uh, stick to our plan and play centipede. I think I prefer this over just murdering the eagle, just get a bit of a board presence going. Very Miscreants as a 2-2 creature. And Eagle gets in for 2. Alright, let's continue developing our mana. And here I don't mind attacking with a Centipede. If my opponent blocks I can murder the Eagle before damage so that the Miscreant dies and the Centipede survives. So yeah, let's move to combats and see what happens. Opponent just takes it. And then I could cast a murder in the opponent's upkeep if I want to play around a counter spell. Since let's say your opponent has a quench at the ready, they could counter my murder. Whereas if I do it in their upkeep, then they will have to waste two mana in their turn instead of being able to use a two mana now. So yeah, let's put a stop in their upkeep with the plan of murdering the eagle before they get a draw step. Opponent does indeed have a quench, so at least we made them use the mana in their turn. But of course uh, the downside is that the eagle still gets to survive. This turn I could either play the Vindictive Vampire or Opportunist plus Thirst. I think I like Opportunist plus Thirst, just take out the Miscreants, get in for a bit of damage. And then we can play the Vampire later. And I don't mind killing the Miscreant now. 
Don't want my opponent to counter the thirst and then play another miscreant. Eagle hits for two. And our opponent does nothing. So we'll play a land attack. And see what happens. That works. Wanted to keep up Dark Remedy in case my opponent uh, trying to do something funny, but now we can just play the Vindictive Vampire instead. Even though it might get countered. But if the Vindictive Vampire gets countered, maybe the Grave Waker will resolve, which of course is uh, the big payoff card here. So another Quench gets her Vampire. We are currently winning the race. And there's land 6 for Grave Waker. If we find land 7, I can also start activating the Opportunist, which is a nice mana sink. So yeah, let's just jam the Grave Waker, hope they're out of counter spells. Definitely an unusual way to build the blue-white flyer deck, usually see a lot more creatures and a lot less interaction. Alright, Grave Waker gets to stick, but might get uh, removed here. It's gonna be a Brazen Borrower, nice mythic from Throne of Eldrain to bounce it for just two mana. So nice tempo play from my opponent, another Tranquil Cove, opponent already gained three life from these. And Eagle hits me down to ten. Alright, Murder was a nice pickup, so my opponent could flash in the Borrower end of turn here and add another flyer to the board, which does get plus one plus one from Eagle. So the plan is probably just to attack here. See what happens. A Rally of Wings to untap Empyrean Eagle to try and block one of my creatures, so this would be a 4-5. So let's just murder it in response. Gets negated. Alright, fair enough. So that's unfortunate. As now Empyrean Eagle gets to ambush one of my creatures. Now I could potentially save the Centipede here with Dark Remedy, which does seem worth it since I'm not using my mana otherwise. Opponent is down to two cards. Hopefully no answer for the Grave Waker, which can stabilize the air nicely. Although Winged Words will help them draw two. Loyal Pegasus, which uh, cannot attack or block alone, so not the most reliable creature. And our opponent's gonna stay on defense, fearing a lethal attack. And I don't mind attacking with the Centipede and trading it for a Flyer. Opponent is kind of forced to block in a way, since if we just play a land and activate Opportunist, they would die. Of course, take out the Empyrean Eagle instead of the Pegasus. Put a counter on the Opportunists. And play Grave Waker, which hopefully resolves. It does. Alright, we've got a 5 5 flyer. Opponent's at 5. But another Brazen Borrower will bounce it back. Now they didn't play the Brazen Borrower. If I were my opponent, I would have maybe just played the Borrower already in exile and then bounced the Grave Waker in uh, their turn so they could attack for more damage potentially. But I guess they're gonna stay back anyway. Now, of course, the Brazen Borrower can only block creatures with flying and uh, Pegasus can block alone. So the Opportunist actually gets a clean attack here if we want to. And yeah, that seems reasonable. I get to empty my hand here too. So let's see if the Grave Waker gets to untap. Second Brazen Borrower. Now if they top deck a Rally of Wings, I could potentially die. I guess I could just block a Borrower and survive. And another Murder, so now my opponent can block with double Pegasus, but I can also just activate my Opportunist here. And that'll do it. All right, sweet. All right, now that we got to see the deck in action, it's time to upgrade our deck. 
So first off, if you're a new player, you'll get a new account mastery tree, and as soon as you play one game with a black deck, you will unlock the Path of Infamy upgrade, which means you get to add one copy of A Child of Night to the deck, and the game will automatically suggest to cut one copy of Bone Splinters to make room for it. So we'll add one copy of Child of Night going up to four and cut one Bone Splinters. Next up, if we keep following the account mastery tree, the next upgrade we get as soon as we unlock one mastery orb will be the indulgence upgrade, which lets us add three copies of Thirsting Bloodlord to the deck, which is a nice payoff card for our vampires. As a four mana 3-3 three, three vampire giving other vampires we control plus one plus one, which is quite nice. So we get three Bloodlords for the deck. And if we follow the game's suggestion, it will recommend to cut two copies of Dark Remedy as well as one copy of Bone Splinters, so we no longer have any Bone Splinters in the deck, and we're down to one copy of Dark Remedy. Next up in the Mastery Tree, we can get the Morbid Hunger upgrade, which gives us one copy of Gruesome Menagerie, which is a five mana sorcery that lets us choose a creature card with convert mana cost one in our graveyard, and the same with a creature with convert mana cost two and three, and then return those cards to the battlefield. So nice way to reanimate multiple creatures at once. So we get one of these. Then we also get one copy of Savage Gorger, a 3-mana 1-1 flying vampire that says at the beginning of your end step, if an opponent lost life this turn, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Gorger, so we get one of these as well. And then we also get a second copy of Knight of the Abel Legion, which of course is a very nice upgrade. So those three cards are added with the Morbid Hunger upgrade, and the game will automatically suggest to cut two copies of Spinal Centipede, as well as the final copy of Dark Remedy to make room for these. So we're back down to 60. And next up, if we get one more Mastery Orb, we can unlock the Persistence upgrade, which gives us one copy of Bolas the Citadel as a nice curve topper that can let us use all the extra life we gain from our lifelink creatures and put that to use to essentially draw extra cards. Since we get to look at the top card of our library at any time and we can play the top card of our library and if we cast a spell this way we pay life equal to its converted mana cost instead of paying its mana cost and then we can also tap the citadel and sacrifice 10 non-land permanents and each opponent will lose 10 life so that's one way to potentially also close out the game. So we get one citadel. Then most importantly we get an additional copy of Bloodthirsty Aerialist which is one of the major payoff cards in the deck. So we go up to three copies of the Aerialist and then we also get a second copy of a Grave Waker as another curve topper. And then to make room for these three new cards, the game will automatically suggest to cut one copy of Spinal Centipede, so we no longer have any centipedes in the deck. And then we also will end up cutting two copies of Soren's Thirst as one of our cheaper removal spells. But we still have two Disfigures and two Thirst to make sure we can handle early aggression. So this is where we end up if we complete the account mastery tree and follow the game's suggestions. And we haven't had to use any wild cards yet, and we can keep doing so by adding some of the cards we get from the two-color guild decks and uh, kind of replace those with some of the weaker cards in the deck. So first up is the blue-black guild, Demir, which gives us access to one copy of Blood Operative which is a 3-mana three 3-1 three life-linking vampire assassin, and when it enters the battlefield we can exile target card from a graveyard, giving us a bit of graveyard hate as well. And whenever we surveil, if blood operative is in our graveyard, we can pay 3 life and return it to our hand. Now we don't have a ton of surveil cards, but uh, we can add one powerful surveil card that's in black, and that is also found in the Demir deck, which is Doom Whisper as a 5 mana 6 6 flying trampling nightmare demon, and we can pay to life to surveil too, so we can kind of manipulate the top of our library to make sure we can keep drawing powerful spells. And since we're gaining so much life, it's not a huge downside to have to pay a bit of life to surveil, so it's a pretty good fit in the deck, even though it's not a vampire. And to make room for these two cards, I don't mind cutting one Grave Waker, which is a bit expensive, and we've added another 5-drop to the deck. And I also don't mind cutting the Meteor Golem at 7 mana, which is pretty pricey as well. And uh, we still have plenty of Curve Toppers here to help us close out the game. And next up we get to the Black Red Guild, Rakdos, which gives us another powerful demon in the form of Spawn of Mayhem, which is a 4-mana, four 4-4 four, four flying trampling demon with a spectacle, so if the opponent lost life, we can play it for just 3 mana, and at the beginning of our upkeep, the spawn will deal 1 damage to each player. Then if we have 10 or less life, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the spawn of mayhem as well. So another powerful flyer that can help us close out the game, and the life loss doesn't matter all that much, since we have so many ways of gaining life. 
And then to make room for Spawn of Mayhem, I don't mind cutting the other Grave Waker, since we've added a bunch more flyers to the deck to help us close. Then we get to the Black Green Guild, Golgari, which gives us another nice tool in the form of Midnight Reaper, which is a 3 mana, 3-2 three zombie knight that says whenever a non-token creature we control dies, Midnight Reaper deals 1 damage to us and we get to draw a card, so a nice source of card advantage in a creature-heavy deck like this one. So we'll add the Reaper, and now that we've cut some of the more expensive cards from the deck, we can pretty safely go down to 24 lands instead of 25. So we'll cut a Swamp. And then we get to the Black-White Guild, Orzov, which gives us two copies of Orzov Enforcer at 2 mana, which is a 1-2 Death Touch with Afterlife 1, so if it dies it leaves behind a 1-1 Flying Spirit token. So a pretty nice 2-drop for the deck. And even though the Enforcer is not a Vampire, I don't mind cutting the Opportunist for it, just because getting to 7 mana for the ability doesn't happen very often, and the Enforcer is a lot more impactful in the early turns. So we'll cut the two opportunists, we still have one as a potential mana sink for the late game. So this is where we end up after upgrading the deck with the Mastery Tree as well as getting some of the nice black cards from the various two-color guild decks. So we haven't had to use any wild cards yet, but the deck already looks quite a bit better. But now it's time to put the finishing touches on the deck using some wild cards. So we'll go over all the commons first, followed by the uncommons, the rares and the mythics that we can add to the deck, also in order of importance. So if there's multiple cards we want to add at a certain rarity, I'll discuss the more important ones first in case you don't have enough wild cards to get all of them at once. So starting with the commons, a nice one for the deck is going to be Blood Burglar. 2 mana for a 2-2 Vampire Rogue that has a lifelink as long as it's our turn. So very similar to the Child of Night, it doesn't have lifelink in the opponent's turn, but we do get one additional toughness which can be quite relevant against all the 1-1 creatures out there. So we will add all 4 copies. And next up we can add a nice land to the deck from Throne of Aldrain, and that is Witch's Cottage. Which is a swamp that enters the battlefield tapped unless we control three or more other swamps. But then when the cottage does enter the battlefield untapped, we can put target creature card from our graveyard on top of our library, giving us a little bit of graveyard recursion, making sure we can redraw those relevant creatures like the Aerialist and the Bloodlord, so that in the late game, even if we draw a land in the form of cottage, we can still make sure we draw some action afterwards. So we'll add two copies of Witch's Cottage to the mana base. Then to make room for the cottages, we can pretty easily cut two swamps. And then to make room for the four copies of a Blood Burglar, we'll cut some of the other two drops. So we'll cut the two Enforcers, which aren't Vampires. Then we also cut the other Opportunists, which is one of the weaker two drops in the deck. And then finally we can remove one copy of Vindictive Vampire, which is one of the weaker creatures in the deck. Now we get to the Uncommons, and there's not much to add. It's pretty straightforward, just complete our playsets of Bloodthirsty Aerialist and the Thirsting Bloodlord, since we will make this a very vampire-focused deck, so we want to maximize on our lords here, and then the Aerialist, of course, is one of the MVPs in the deck, so it's a no-brainer to add a fourth copy. And to make room for these, we can easily cut the two remaining copies of Vindictive Vampire. And now we get to our rares, where we will add two more copies of Knight of the Abel Legion, as a very powerful one-drop that's also a vampire, so perfect fit for the deck. Then, even though it's not a vampire, we will add the full playset of Murderous Rider to the deck, which is for the most part an upgrade over Murder, as it gives us the same removal spell, but it can also target Planeswalkers, even though it does cost us 2 life, and then afterwards we still get access to the 2-3 lifelinking knight, that again is not a vampire, but a 2-3 lifelinker still fits in the deck quite nicely. And then the last rare we can add to the deck is a lot less important than the ones we've already added, and it's going to be another land from Throne of Eldraine, Castle Lockthwain, which is a land that enters the battlefield tapped unless we control a swamp, and then for 3 mana and tapping the castle we can draw a card, and we lose life equal to the number of cards in our hand, so it gives us access to a late game card draw engine, hopefully for empty handed so we don't take too much damage from it, but just a nice way to refuel, especially against the more controlling decks out there. So we can add two copies of Castle Lockthwain. And then of course to make room for the castle, we'll cut two more swamps. And then to make room for the four copies of Murder's Rider, we can easily cut the Murders. And for the last couple cuts, we'll cut the Savage Gorger, which is a bit underpowered at three mana, even though it does have some nice synergy in the deck. And we can also cut two copies of Child of Night, as we've added some more cheap creatures to the deck in the form of Knight of the Ebon Legion. 
And important to note about all the rares we've just added to the deck, Knight of Ebon Legion, Murder Strider, and Castle Lockthwain, is that all these rares see plenty of play outside of this deck, so there will be plenty of other decks happy to have those cards. But now as we get to the Mythic rare upgrades, you won't see any of these Mythics outside of a dedicated Vampire deck, so they are a lot less flexible than some of the rares we've just crafted, so you do have to be pretty committed to the Vampire theme if you want to craft these. And the first one we're gonna get is the full playset of Sorin, Imperious Bloodlord. Sorin starts out at 4 loyalty and has two different plus one abilities. The first one says a target creature we control gains death touch and lifelink until end of turn. And if it's a vampire we can also put a plus one plus one counter on it, which is great. And then the second plus one can let us sacrifice a vampire. And when we do, Sorin deals three damage to any targets and we gain three life. So we can sacrifice some of our weaker creatures to maybe take out an opposing planeswalker or creature, that's a problem. And then the minus three, which we can use right away as soon as we play Sorin, lets us put a vampire creature card from our hand onto the battlefield. So especially with our more expensive vampires like the Thirsting Bloodlord, this can come in handy. So we'll add the entire playset of Sorin Imperious Bloodlord. And then the next mythic we add to the deck also has a great synergy with Sorin, as it's going to be a more expensive vampire that we can maybe cheat into play on turn 3, thanks to Sorin's minus 3 ability. And that's going to be the Haunt of Hightower, which is a 6 mana 3-3 three, three legendary creature vampire with flying and lifelink. And whenever the Haunt of Hightower attacks, defending player has to discard a card. And whenever a card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on the Haunt of Hightower. So of course plenty of ways that cards can end up in the opponent's graveyard. If they discard to the Haunt's ability, that will count. If one of their creatures die, if maybe they just cast an instant or sorcery, then all those uh, will add up and the Haunt will start growing very quickly. So very powerful curve topper for the deck that we can cheat into play thanks to Soren's minus 3 ability. And then to make room for these new mythics, we will streamline the deck. So we can cut the Midnight Reaper, the Blood Operative, we will cut uh, Demons, Spawn of Mayhem and Doom Whisper can go, the Menagerie is no longer necessary. And we will also cut the Bolas of Citadel. So now our deck is nice and streamlined, pretty low to the ground. We still have some cheap removal in the form of Disfigure and Soren's Thirst. And then our bigger removal in the form of Murderous Rider. But uh, Soren can always deal 3 damage to something as well. So we've got plenty of removal, lots of cheap creatures, Knight of Ebon Legion. Vampire of Dire Moon are both excellent. Then at 2 mana our deck suffers a little bit. We have Blood Burglar and Child of Night, which aren't the most impressive 2 drops, but they're still quite important to apply early pressure. They both gain life for the Aerialist synergy, and of course we can keep enhancing them with Sorin's plus 1 or the Thirsting Bloodlord, so they are still important pieces of the puzzle. Then we have our Aerialist as one of our better creatures that can quickly outgrow red burn spells and help us close out the game. Murder Strider being quite flexible as both a removal spell or an extra lifelinking creature. Of course Sorin to enhance our team and to maybe put a Haunt of Hightower in play on turn 3 which is pretty sweet. And then uh, the Thirsting Bloodlord, one of the other payoff cards for sticking to the Vampire theme. And then the Haunt itself of course a nice finisher as well. And then the mana base also picked up some nice improvements with the two Castle Lockthwain to draw more cards if we're empty handed. And the Witch's Cottage to maybe put some high impact creatures back on top in the late game. So overall a pretty synergistic mono black life gain vampire deck. Now there are potential ways to keep improving the deck. We could add a second color, we can add white for cards like Cruel Celebrant, or blue for cards like Atrata and Nightfill Predator, which are nice ones to put in play with Soren's minus 3 ability. Those are options. We could also add a surveil package with cards like Whispering Snitch and Blood Operative, maybe Doom Whispers as repeatable sources of surveil. So there's still plenty of ways to continue upgrading the deck if you want to. But for now let's add some finishing touches to the deck. So we can choose our basic land art. And I'm gonna go with the full art Unhinged Land I unlocked a while back. We'll put uh, Soren in the picture and choose our sleeve. And then we're ready to battle. So this is our deck. Now let's jump into some games and see how our deck does. Alright, we're on the draw. And yeah, our hand doesn't have a ton of early plays, but we do get to play Soren and put a Haunt of Hightower in play, which will sometimes uh, be good enough, so we'll try. Facing turn 1 Mountain, well, happy to have the Soren's Thirst in hand in this matchup. Child of Night to pick up. So this appears to be the Cavalcade deck. Turn 2 Spitter, which usually you see the Spitter played on turn 1, so they might have drawn that for the turn. 
and we have the choice of playing out Child of Night or casting the Thirst. Although you could make the argument that, let's say my opponent has a burn spell to kill one of my creatures, if they use it on a child, then they might not have it for the Haunt of Hightower, which of course if it survives will be quite strong. Yeah, maybe that's the reason to play Child here, which I'm okay trading off for one of their creatures as well, but they might kill it with a burn spell. Opponent just sends the Grim Initiate, which has first strike, so we will take one. Alright, so the Child of Night was able to hold off the Dodger and the Spitter at least. Live the stage with Spectacle. Finds two lands and a Fervent Champion. Second main. Alright. So, they didn't seem to have removal from uh, the way they played that turn. So I could go for the Sorin into Haunt of Hightower play. Yeah, let's go for it. Now Sorin is pretty likely to die next turn, but we got our 6 drop in play, which is what matters. No great attack into the first striker. So if Haunt of Hightower gets to survive, we have a decent chance, otherwise we were in uh, serious trouble. So the Dodger can finish off Sorin. And there's the Cavalcade, the namesake card. Opponent will send lots of creatures at uh, Sorin to make sure to kill it. But the Cavalcade also deals damage to the Planeswalker that's being attacked. And now I could block, but my opponent might have a Shock in hand that they want to use in combination with First Strike to take out my Haunt of Hightower, which doesn't quite seem worth it here. So I will just take the damage, since as soon as we get one counter on the Haunt of Hightower we'll be safe. I've got a few options. I could main phase, run out Aerialists, Haunt attacks, opponent discards, this gets a counter and this gets a counter, and I also get to play the Vampire. That seems pretty decent. Could even send in the Child of Night, which I'm happy to trade with the Spitter, which will also grow the Aerialists. So yeah, let's do that. Now if my opponent has a Shock, they might kill the Child of Night before it gets to deal damage. And yep, yeah, discard Shock, but they have another card in hand that they wanted to save instead. So Aerialist picks up a counter for each instance of lifelink. And a Vampire on defense. It's gonna be a Chandra Spitfire, which does survive the two damage from Surin's Thirst, but we now have two pretty sizable flyers that can uh, compete with it. And yeah, my opponent is gonna concede. The turn 3 Haunt of Hightower of Sorin able to defeat the Cavalcade deck. Sweet, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the play with a reasonable hand. We've got a 1-drop, couple 2-drops to choose from, and then a Murder Shider to clear path. This hand could benefit from a Sorin or one of our 4 mana lords. Facing Gilded Goose, which I can attack into with my Vampire at least. So let's attack. And play Burglar. Turn to Paradise Druid, so this could be all sorts of uh, blue-green ramp decks. Castle Lockthwain, and of course the uh, Rider is going to be great at answering opposing Planeswalkers, which are uh, pretty key. So let's just attack and then play Child of Knights. I'm okay trading for the Paradise Druid. And there's a Wicked Wolf, that's a good one. Doesn't even need to sacrifice a food token to make the wolf indestructible. So now the Murder Strider is uh, pretty awkward. Now, I can still attack with Vampire of Dire Moon. If my opponent blocks and makes it indestructible, I can respond with Murder Strider. So that's what I'm gonna do here. And then I have another Vampire to keep on defense. Opponent will make that play. 
so I can just pass priority. Opponents sacks the food, and we can respond with a rider. So my opponent did get kind of a two for one here, but uh, we still get the other half of the murderous rider, so it could have been worse. We don't get any life from the vampire, but of course that's fine. And we made our opponent use a food token, which is of course quite relevant with Gilded Goose. There's Nissa. Now of course my opponent might have uh, expected the Murder Strider, but they were okay with it given that they had a Nissa in hand. But we have the second Murder Strider to hopefully take Nissa out of commission. I don't think I can afford to kill the land and attack Nissa since we won't be able to finish her off. So I'm just gonna kill Nissa outright and I'm okay trading the vampires for the land. So let's send the vampires at their face since I don't want to attack a Nissa that I'm gonna kill anyway. Opponent can tap the forest for double green to make uh, food with a gilded goose. But there's not much we can do about it. And don't want my opponent to untap with Nissa, otherwise they might have a very big hydroid crisis to gain a ton of life and draw a ton of cards, which we're probably not beating. Alright, so we are behind, opponent has four cards in hand, plenty of mana, but at least we managed to deal with the first Nissa. And there's Hydroid Crisis, X equals 4, could have been a lot more with Nissa still in play. But uh, still very good here. So yeah, I don't really see myself winning this game if we don't draw one of our uh, payoff cards soon. Haunt of Hightower I'm pretty close to casting, although it won't really be able to compete with the Crisis right away. I can activate the castle, which will cost me 2 life, or I can run out a murder Rider, which doesn't really have a huge impact on this game. So let's send in the Vampires of Dire Moon. Which are doing a pretty good job of pressuring my opponent at least. Activate Castle in case we draw land, Disfigure. Maybe I should have activated it main phase in case I drew Disfigure so a Child of Night plus Disfigure could trade for Krasis. Now I might want to just kill the Paradise Druid, or I could save this until after I play Haunt of Hightower to get it bigger. Yeah, I guess I'll wait. The one mana difference could matter, but getting the Haunt of Hightower one bigger might be even more important. Alright, opponent is playing the Bant version. Splashing a bit of white, Questing Beast. Usually the white is for Deputy of Detention. Now I could also use this figure in combination with Child of Night to maybe take something out, although I won't be able to block Questing Beast. So it would just be to trade for a forest, which doesn't seem super enticing. So yeah, let's just take 11 here, which is quite a bit. And a Merleaf Pixie as well. Another 2-2, which I could disfigure end of turn. I think I'm gonna just untap here. Not a Murder Strider. I can uh, kill the Questing Beast perhaps, wait until the opponent attacks in case they have a second one in hand. I guess I can send in one Vampire of Dire Moon, the other one can maybe trade for Forest. Could also send in Child of Night, if they block with a Beast I can disfigure it, maybe that's acceptable. Alright, fine. And then keep one Vampire of Dire Moon on defense. If I hit my land drop for Haunt of Hightower we would have played it slightly differently. But now I think I gotta make something happen. So I don't have to disfigure now, I can let damage happen first since the child dies anyway. In case my opponent had some interaction. So we'll disfigure there. And say go. And then the murder strider might end up killing the hydroid here. So the two flyers attack, kill one of them. Alright, so we're down to 10. Opponent still has uh, the two copies of Gilded Goose to make food and gain life. So we're not killing them anytime soon. But hopefully we can take over the game with Haunt of Hightower. 
Ooh, another hydroid crisis. That's probably the final nail in the coffin here. Nice way to refuel. And still no land 6 for haunts. So it's not looking good here. I guess I can disfigure the pixie and then draw with castle, but then I'm probably dead. I'll take 2 down to 8. Yeah, that's gonna be kind of tricky to recover from. I guess one vampire can attack. And we'll play Murder Strider and keep up uh, this figure. I guess I'll probably end up disfiguring the pixie anyway, so might as well do it now. Yeah, might have had a chance with Haunt in play, making it bigger, a nice flying lifelinker. Could uh, try and compete with Hydroid, but uh, it's not looking good now. The fairy, so that's what they're playing white for as well. And a deputy, so they had both uh, splash cards here. Gets rid of double vampire. The fairy could bounce rider. Am I dead? I guess not dead on board. But I am taking nine. The fairy's gonna plus. And there's a land at long last, but now they can just bounce haunt with the fairy. And, uh,. That's pretty much game over. Don't really see a way out. Alright, GG's. Alright, we're on the draw with a reasonable hand. Got some early plays and then the Aerialist plus Vampire of Dire Moon. And looks like we're up against the Mardu Knights. Alright, so this is going to be a nice uh, aggro mirror match, basically, but we have some nice cheap removal as well as some life gain to help us, so we might stand a chance. Now, turn one. I think I want to keep this figure to kill my opponent's lords, so I'm just going to play Vampire of Dire Moon for now. Of course, I do also have the Soren's Thirst, so I could have maybe considered just killing the Venerable Knight. Alright, Skyguard also... A better target for my removal. I could save Thirst until after I play Aerialist, but it's much more mana efficient to Thirst the Vanguard now, so I think that's what I'll do. And I could even consider attacking. If my opponent blocks a Venerable Knight, thinking they get a counter, I can at instant speed kill the Vanguard. Sure. Opponent just takes it, which is also acceptable. And I'll kill this now, because you never know. Opponent might have some pump spells. Alright, acclaimed contender. We'll get to search up another knight. Finds another venerable knight. Play aerialist and attack. And I'm okay with the trade. Aerialist picks up a counter. So pretty even game so far. Of course, gotta watch out for those Amber Cleaves. Out of the Knight's deck. Sky Knight Legionnaire I can block with my Aerialist. So they don't have any great attacks. And they have to just ship it back. Our hand's shaping up nicely with all these cheap removal spells. This is definitely a matchup where these cards shine. I suppose I could still attack with Vampire of Dire Moon. And kind of see what happens. Opponent pretty likely to trade it off. And I guess I want to thirst a Legionnaire before damage just to pick up an extra counter. Even though there's a small chance they might end up putting the plus one counter on the Legionnaire from the Venerable Knight dying. And I'll say go. Double this figure at the ready. Worthy knight, definitely worthy of a disfigure. So I'll try and kill that as soon as I can. But not before my opponent plays another knight to get a token. So that resolves, my opponent's empty handed. And attacks. I suppose I could kill the venerable knight. The dice. They're gonna attempt to put the counter on the Worthy Knight, so we got some nice value here with the second Disfigure. 
So that's why we sequence it that way. Aerialists can uh, close out the game pretty quickly here. And then the Murder Shrider can take out the Contender. Don't have to do it right away, might as well wait. Another Contender, sure. So I could kill the, the first Contender, but they would still have another Knight in play. And uh, Mardu Knight deck doesn't have a ton of removal, but Amber Cleave is potentially a way they could steal this. So... Yeah, I could save the Murder Strider until they, like, equip one of their creatures with Amber Cleave, but I probably end the game before that matters. So yeah, they still can't play Amber Cleave here. I guess I'll just kill the Contender. Down to 16, another Murder Strider. Can just attack for 5. Play Murder Strider on defense. And Aerialist should be able to close out the game here. Fervent Champion's not gonna make a difference. So I'm okay blocking here. They can Amber Cleave me, but I'm far from dead. And then the Aerialist will be enough to win the game. So the double strike from Amber Cleave means I don't gain any life for my Aerialist. But yeah, there we go, sweet. So the Mono Black Vampire deck definitely pretty favorable against other aggressive strategies, thanks to all those cheap removal spell and life gain cards and uh, against some of the decks that go bigger, like the different ramp decks, those cheap removal spells are going to be a lot less useful, and instead we got to rely on Soren and uh, Bloodlord to kind of pump up our team and hopefully kill the opponent quickly, or finish them off with our different uh, evasive creatures, the Aerialist and the Haunt of Hightower, of course, are great in those matchups as well. So the deck can definitely win some games, even though we're not playing the most powerful cards in Standard, but uh, yeah, that's going to wrap things up for today's upgrade guide. Feel free to let me know in the comments which deck we should upgrade next. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.